to commit yourself to the answer of the Lord in prayers. You want to tell the Lord that as we go into the word of God, that the Lord himself will speak his way to your heart. The very last day is coming very soon. My brother, are you ready? Are you preparing yourself for that great last day? That day, the trumpet will soon sound. Where will you spend your eternity, my brother? Think about that. Tell the Lord that the Lord himself will prepare you for his coming. Because that great day of the Lord is coming. You want to ask the Lord that the Lord himself will prepare you. The Lord himself will prepare you, my brother. Tell the Lord this very day that the Lord himself will prepare you for his coming. That as the word of God comes to you right now, that you will not be dull of hearing, but that the Lord will use his way to prepare you for his coming, for that great day of the Lord that is coming. You want to prepare yourself for eternity, eternity with God, so that when the trumpet will sound, my brother, when the trumpet will sound, my sister, you will not be missing on that day. You will not be missing on that day. Ask the Lord that the Lord himself will prepare you, my brother. That the Lord himself will prepare you. Prepare yourself to meet with the Lord. Because that trumpet of the Lord is coming. In that great day. In that great day, my brother, are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready, my brother? Are you ready? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the encouragement and the warning we receive from the choir that that great day is coming. And we've read it, and we are still going to read it again. Lord, I pray that what we are going to read from your word today will prepare us for eternity and eternity with you. Speak your way to every heart, Lord. None of us will be dull of hearing, but that, Lord, you will write this word upon the table of our hearts so that on that day, none of us will regret the words that we've had today. Thank you, Father, because you have an answer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we come to the end of our worship service today, we want to consider an important aspect of the Word of God, a subject matter that will prepare you for your eternity with God. When we look at the events of all the happenings, of all the things happening around us, this gives us the concern that we need to get ourselves ready. We need to get ourselves prepared because the end is at the very door of our lives. That's why tonight we are considering the message titled Prophetic Insights into the Events of an Imminent End. Prophetic insights into the events of an eminent hand. The Lord Himself did not leave us ignorant of the things that are going to clamor the end of the old world. That's why before He Himself left the earth, He gave us these things, the prophetic insights of all the events that reclamers the end of our own generation. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. I'll read verses 3, 14, and 25. Matthew chapter 24, verse 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, 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 
brethren, can I tell you this very afternoon? There are some experiences you will have with the Lord, not when you are in the public domain. There are some experiences that can only be acquired when you are alone with the Lord. When you are alone with the Lord. Not when you have the public supporting you. Not when you are in the midst of the public. There are some experiences that you will have only, and there are some revelations you will have only when you are alone with the Lord. That's why we always tell us in this church, it's very important that you have your own personal devotion, personal quiet time, personal time with the Lord, so that you can have time, you can, have, you go, you can, have, you can enjoy fellowship with the Lord. You see, the disciples see it. They were alone with the Lord. They came to him privately, saying, Tell us, tell us, you see there, their desire to know. You see there, they are longing to know more. They are longing. You know, that's why we are telling you that, that there is a need. If you must go far with the Lord, there is a need for a desire. There is a need for an inquisition. There is a need for passion. There is a need for zeal. There is a need to know. They told the Lord, tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the signs of, their com- of thy coming? And of the end of the world. Three things there the Lord told, you know, they, they were asking the Lord. Because in chapter, in verse 2, Jesus said unto them, See ye all this, see ye not all these things. Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be trodden down. So they were asking the Lord, This thing you just told us in verse 2. Tell us, Lord. When shall these things be? What was he telling them? He was telling them about the temple. Because they showed the Lord the temple. They told the Lord, look at the building of this temple in Jerusalem. The Lord now told them that a time is coming that there will be no stone that will be left behind in that temple. That everything will be trodden down. Then I asked the Lord, Lord, this thing you just told us now, Tell us, when shall this thing be? Not only that, they went further. That's why we always tell us, don't just stay in your salvation experience. I am saved, I am saved. That is not enough. Make an effort to go further with the Lord. Make an effort to press higher in Christian experiences. Salvation alone is not enough. There is what we call sanctification. The removal of the Adamic nature. Are you pressing higher? You say, oh, I'm sanctified. How about the Holy Ghost baptism? Are you pressing higher to be baptized in the Holy Ghost? You say, oh, pastor, you know, I'm saved, I'm sanctified, I'm baptized in the Holy Ghost. Thank God for you. But are you making efforts to press higher in your Christian experiences? You see, the disciples, they did not just stop at the destruction of the temple alone. Then I ask the Lord, there is something more than this temple. And I'm telling you, brethren, there is something more than this life we are living today. There is something more, more than this life we are living today. There is something more, more than the experience that you have today. There is something more, more, more deeper. They ask the Lord, tell us, Lord, when shall these things be? Then the second thing, what shall be the signs of thy coming? You've told us in John that you are coming. You told us that you will die and the third day you will arise and then you go to the Father, but then you will come back again for us. Tell us, Lord, what shall be the signs? How do we know that you are coming? What are the signs? And this thing they were asking the Lord here, this event here is not just, it's not just you know, the event of, it is saying of thy coming, the signs of thy coming. And then the third one, they now said, what was the third question they asked the Lord? Of what? Is that in your Bible? I'm asking you, is that in your Bible? Then why are you living as if this world will not end? 
Then why are you putting all your concentration, all your aspiration, all your hope, all your longing, as if this war will never end? They ask the Lord, we know this world is going to end. What shall be the signs, the signs of the, of the end of the war, of thy coming and of the end of the war, of the end of the war? Brethren, then the Lord told them in verse 14, look at verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end do what? Come. The Lord even confirmed it. The end is coming. Is imminent. It will happen in a twinkling, in a twinkling of an eye. The end is coming. But it says, before that time, this gospel of the kingdom. But then it's not enough to have knowledge. We must take the knowledge we have and take it out there because there are many that are living as if this war will never end. That's why the odds is on us today that we as believers, we should not be ignorant and with the knowledge of the end of the war that we have, that should push us, that should inspire us, that should put the zeal in us to take the gospel into every cruise and corners of our communities. Of our communities. In verse 25 of our text, Matthew chapter 24, Behold, I have told you before. You see the Lord now emphasizing again. He says, Behold, I have told you before. These things I'm telling you now, they are not new. These things I'm telling you now, they are not new. Maybe you are so. What I'm hearing today, they are not new. That's what the Lord is saying. He's confirming that. He says, Behold, I have told you these things before. What is the thing the Lord has told them before? In Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. I will read from verse 40 of Matthew chapter 13. As therefore the tares were gathered and born in the fire. Matthew chapter 13 verse 40. So shall be in the end of this war. You see that the Lord emphasizes it again. The end of this war. This war will surely end. It will surely end. There is an end that is determined for this war. That's why he now said, I have told you these things before. What did he tell them again before? In verse 41, the Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them that do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be what? There shall be what? Wailing. And what? And blanching of teeth. Verse 49. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from the jaws and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and blanching of teeth. That's what the Lord was saying. I've told you these things before. That the time is coming when there will be a separation an eternal separation. A time is coming when there will be, you know, the, the wicked shall be silver from the righteous and all those that do iniquity, they shall be cast into the furnace of fire. That's the end of what the Lord, the Lord was telling the disciples that I have told you these things before in Matthew chapter 24. Prophetic insight into the event of an imminent end. Matthew chapter 24. I will read that. That's why he now told us what we need to do as we want to get ourselves prepared for the end of this world. What is, what is our responsibilities? You see in verse 20, 32 there, he says, Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When the branch is yet tender and put forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise, when ye shall see all these things, all these things we are going to read together in the word of God today, when you see all these things, the signs of the destruction, the signs 
signs of the end of the world. When you see all these things, what are we to do? He says, know that it is near, even at the door. No, you need to know. My brother, you need to know. My sister, you need to know. We should not be ignorant of the prophetic insight into the imminent end of this world. We shouldn't be ignorant. The word of God is enough for us. I always tell us in this church that I don't depend on any revelation. I don't depend on any dream. Oh, somebody went to hell and came back alive and is telling me that uh, there is hell. The Bible has told me already and that suffice. That there is hell. Jesus himself said it. The apostles, they confirmed it. I don't need any other revelation. I don't need any other vision. I don't need any other dreams. That's why he said, yeah, ye shall know these things. Then what should we do? That's what we are considering today. He says in verse 42, watch therefore. Watch. Watch. The end is imminent. Watch. This is not the time to be careless, my brother. This is not the time to be idle, my sister. This is not the time to give to carnality. This is not the time to allow all the non-essential to cloud the essential thing of our life. The preparation for an eternity with God. That's why the Lord says, watch. Watch your habits. Watch your attitude. Watch your behavior. Watch your character. Watch your conduct. Watch. Watch. Because the end is imminent. For you know not what hour your Lord doth come. Watch. Watch. Christ did not leave the church in the dark concerning the events of the end time. It did not. If you look at this Matthew chapter 24 alone, six, uh, six uh, 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 division in this chapter 24 alone, you see from verses 1 to 3, there was the concern about the end of the world. The disciples, they expressed that concern. They were concerned. Tell us, what shall be the signs of their coming? Then you see from verses 4 to 26, the Lord gives us the conditions, the conditions the world will be in to accumulate the end of the world, the conditions, the conditions. And then in verses 27 to 31, you see that the coming, the coming at the end of the world, that's his coming. Then you see in verses 32 to 36, you see the calendar, the calendar there, the calendar there, the things that will be happening that will lead, that will lead to the end of the world. And then in verses 37 and to, 12, to 42, there will be a capturing. What we know, they're catching away, they're catching away before the end of the world. And then lastly, in verses 43 to 51, the caution for believers, the caution for us to watch. That's why as you look at this chapter, the Lord. God did not leave his church in the dark about the event. That's why in response to the disciples' question, he gave, like I said, the conditions and the signs that will precede his coming, which we already will see happening all around us today. All these signs are happening. All these things are happening. Nations fighting against each other. Why they are signing one peace treaty, another nation is just putting up another uh, fight again. Wars, here and there. The world has never no peace. And the world will never know peace until the end of the war. Because there is no peace, says the Lord, unto who? Unto the wicked. As long as there is still wickedness in this war. As long as there is still unrighteousness in this war. As long as, you know, people can still you know, show defiance to the word of God and say, well, they, 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 you know, we do know God here. As long as that is still here, the world will know no peace. That's why the Lord is telling us today that we should not be ignorant. And you, you will not be ignorant in Jesus' name. They ask for three things. 
the destruction of Jerusalem, the temple in Jerusalem, when will that be? And the Lord told them what it will be. And do you know what? Seventy years after the death of Christ, A.D. 70, then this man, General Titus, he came into Jerusalem and he destroyed Jerusalem completely. He overrun Jerusalem and even the temple. The temple that the Jews at that time, they took pride in. He destroyed everything, leveled everything. And can I tell you today, so sad that today, where you have that temple, that is where you even have one of the, you know, largest um, 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 uh, mosques in the old world, in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem. Completely destroyed. AD 70 by General Titus. That has been accomplished. But the other two, the signs of thy coming and of the end of the war. Those two have not been accomplished yet. And that's why the Lord is now telling us what the prophetic insight into the event. For better understanding, we want to consider this under three sub heading Point one, we consider the suddenness of our glorious translation. Three events the Lord is showing us here. In Matthew chapter 24, then point two, we consider the suffering during the great tribulation. The suffering during the great tribulation. And lastly, we consider the sentence at the great white throne judgment. The sentence at the great white throne judgment. Now, for the first part of the, uh, the second part of the question, I've told you the first part has already been accomplished, AD 70 by General Titus. The second part, the signs of thy coming. Now, the, co- the second coming of Christ is divided into two phases. Do you understand? The second coming of Christ. There is the time the Lord will come. The first phase of his second coming. He will not come on the earth here. He will just appear in the sky. And that's what we call today the rapture. The glorious translation. That's the first phase of his second coming. Of his second coming. And do you know, brethren, that rapture will be sudden. That rapture will happen in the twinkling of an eye. That rapture of the church will happen in a moment, in a moment, in a moment. You know, at that time, there will be no, well, uh, 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 Jesus, give me time to repent. It will be too late. It will be too late. Because it will be sudden. In a moment of an, in a moment, that's when the rapture will take place. Let's see what the Bible talks about the rapture here. In First Thessalonians chapter four, the suddenness of our glorious translation, and it's a translation, is our own translation. The rapture of the church, you know, is an event. Can I tell you this evening? You know, um, uh, po, um, Daniel in the Old Testament. He saw the seven, he had what he called the 70 weeks in Daniel's prophecy. Daniel had 70 weeks in his prophecy. And out of that 70 weeks, 69 weeks of Daniel's prophecy leads to the first you know, um, uh, time when Christ, leads to the time Christ will come to die for our sin, his first coming. Do you understand? 69 weeks. Now, between that 69 weeks and the 70th week of Daniel, Daniel was ignorant of the events that will happen at that time. The Lord never showed it to Daniel because that revelation was not for Daniel. Daniel was a Jew. That revelation was a revelation that was blank to Daniel. He never understood that one is what will happen between the 69th week and the 70th week. Because if you look at that, you see it in Isaiah. Even Isaiah himself, he never saw that one week. He just knew in Isaiah, let me just show you, is an event that was ignorant. The Old Testament prophets were ignorant of it. In Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. I will read verses to just show you that the, the um, Old Testament prophet, they were ignorant of this event. As Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, he says, For unto us a child is born. A child is born where? A maxim where? 
Where was the child born? Bethlehem. Thank you. God bless you. For unto us a son is given. Where was the son given? Where was the son given? Calvary. Thank you. Those are the Bible students. Calvary. The son is given to Calvary. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten wood. Is it a child? No, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Now, he says there, now look at this prophecy now. If you look at your Bible very well, what do you see after unto us a son is given? What do you see? No, I'm asking, what sign do you see? What sign do you see? Colon, English today. What, is, what does the colon tell you? Eh? There is a pause. There is something that should happen before the son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And that event, Isaiah paused because he was ignorant of that event. Because the event was not for them. Do you understand? That's the pause there. He says, and then... And what will happen? And the government shall be upon his shoulder. He now went beyond the son is given. And he jumped. He just jumped immediately from the son is given. Imagine. So the government shall be upon his shoulder. That's the millennial reign of Christ. When Christ will come the second time to reign. And it will reign over all the earth. So at that time, this event we are talking about, the rapture, the, our glorious is, a, is an event for the Gentile, for the Gentile church. It's an event that the Old Testament prophets, they were ignorant of it. It's an event that they never had, you know, they never had prophetic insight into it. That's why God gave it to a, a New Testament apostle by name Paul the Apostle in 1 Thessalonians. Open your Bible quickly. You see the way Paul talked about it, our glorious translation. 1 Thessalonians, I will read from verse 4 of 1 Thessalonians. From verse, uh, uh, chapter 4, I will read verse 13 of First Thessalonians. But I will not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, us, even so them also which sleep in Jesus we go bring with him, with him, with him, with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord shall do what? Descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of the Lord. And the dead in Christ shall do what? The dead in Christ shall do what? Shall rise forth. And then we, which are alive. We, which are alive. Alive in Christ. Alive in his word. Alive, sensitive to the spirit of God. We, which are alive and remain. Still remaining, abiding in the faith. Not those who have gone. We, which are alive. Shall we do what? Shall we do what? Shall we cut off? shall be cut off. That's the rapture day. In the Greek, that word, cut off, originally means rapture. Do you understand? Shall be cut off. That's rapture. Rapture implies the catching away of the saints. And he says, where will we do? To be cut off with them in the cloud to meet the Lord on earth here? I'm asking you, on earth here? No, in the air. It's sudden. It's a sudden event. In a twinkling of an eye. In a moment. In fact, Paul the Apostle went further. He says in 1 in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'll read from verse 51. He says, the Behold, I show you a mystery. Brethren, what we are talking about today, the glorious translation, the rapture of the church, is a mystery. 
mystery to the, New, to the Old Testament believers. But for us today, it's no more a mystery because the Lord has revealed it to us. And you know about it. He says, Behold, I show you a mystery. A mystery in the Old Test- for the Old Testament believers. But for us, it's no more a mystery. I show you a mystery. And what is that mystery? He says, We shall not what? We shall not all. We shall not all. We shall not all sleep. We shall not all sleep. What does that imply? Not every believer will die before the rapture. Not every believer will die. You know, for the believers, death is a translation to glory. Do you understand? So Paul the Apostle was writing, they say, we shall not all sleep. Because at the time of the rapture, there will still be some faithful believers on the earth. I pray you will be part of those believers. He says, we shall not all sleep. We shall not all sleep. But we shall what? But we shall all, we shall all be changed. We shall all be translated. How will it happen? In verse 52, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Can you twink your eye for me? Can you, twink, as I'm looking at you now, please twink your eye. Twink your eye. Does it take a second? Does it take a minute? Does it take, can you count the number of seconds it takes you to twink your eye? That's what Paul the Apostle is telling us there. But when the rapture will happen suddenly, the rapture will happen when men are still asleep. The rapture will happen when men are still lost in the things of the world. He says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the, at the last throne, for the trumpet shall sound. The trumpet will sound. And only those who are alive in Christ, and only those who are alive in Christ will hear the twinkling of the trumpet. He says there, and the, and the dead in Christ shall rise incorruptible, and we shall be changed. I will be changed. I will be changed. The rapture of the saints will be unexpected. We are put on announced. The glorious exit of the people of God whose names are in the book of life. That's why you need to examine yourself today. Is your name written in the book of life? Is your name in that book of life? I'm not talking of in the book of the church. I'm not talking of I come to deeper life. Coming to deeper life is not enough. It's your name in the book of life. Have you taken it? Have you taken time to examine yourself, to ask yourself that question? God, I want to find out if my name is in the book of life. If, and if you are sincere with that question to God, God will be sincere to you as well. Ask yourself. You see, the rapture is the glorious ending for all those who are remaining, all those who are alive, all those whose names are written in the book of life. It is understandable when Paul the Apostle, he exhorted the believers in 1 Thessalonians to only live him, to righteous live him, because of this eminent coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the first phase. Remember, we are still talking about the first phase, the rapture of his second coming. The Lord will appear in the sky to take his says because he himself said it. Look at it in John chapter 14. He didn't want us to be ignorant. That's why he told us in John chapter 14, verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. There will be trials in this world. There will be persecutions in this world. There will be troubles in this world. If you're a Christian and the world gives you no trouble, I'm telling you, examine your kind of Christianity. If the world, if you find pleasures in this world, if the world gives you satisfaction, if the world likes your own kind, your own brand of Christianity, and there's no troubles coming from the world, and there's no opposition coming from the world, and there's no persecution coming from the world, and there's no trial coming from the world, and everything is just okay for you. Everything. You open your eye like this, the thing, the thing you want to eat is there. Before you open the truth to the other side, everything is there, neat and tidy. I'm telling you, examine the kind of your own Christianity. Because for two Christians, Jesus himself, our Lord and Savior, told us, let not your heart be troubled. There are things that will come to trouble your heart. 
There are things that will come to try your faith. There are things that want to push you, that want to pull you away from the hold of the Lord. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. I believe in Christ. I say I believe in Christ. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will do what? I will do what? What did you say there? I will come again. Jesus is coming again. He's coming for me. I say he's coming for me. But when Jesus himself said it, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. That's the promise of the Lord, and he will fulfill it in Jesus' name. At the time of the rapture, the believers, we've read it already in 1 Thessalonians, who are dead. You know, when a believer dies, and I, I was discussing with the sister some time ago. I told her that, that all, all the Christians, all the true believers I've seen that died, there's always a smile. There was always a smile on their faces. Every true believer. When you see somebody that died and is holding, is biting his finger, I'm telling you, I'm not sure if that person is in heaven. Every true believer. Because Paul the Apostle himself told us here that we, those who died in Christ, they are asleep. When the believer died, in fact, Jesus himself told us with the story of rich man and Lazarus. When Lazarus, when the rich man died, what, Jesus, what did Jesus say? What did he say? He said that they buried him. Is that not so? But when he said, when Lazarus died, what happened to Lazarus? He was carried. Into whose? Abraham's bosom. Abraham's bosom. Abraham's bosom. And the rich man recognized, he recognized Lazarus. You know, when a man dies, man is made of three things. The soul, the spirit, and the body. And the body. When a man dies, get it from today, the soul and the spirit will go to the destination that is determined by that man when he was here on earth. There are two destinations. There is nothing like purgatory with God. Jesus didn't tell us that. He says the rich man, when he died, he opened up his eyes. Is it a purgatory? When did he open up his eyes? He opened up his eyes in hell. Two destinations. That's why you want to examine yourself today. So when a man dies, the soul and the spirit will go to his maker. And the maker with his, with his work will determine where that soul and spirit will go, heaven or hell. The body. That's why it surprises me today. This body that has no value. That's what we are all concerned about. How does it affect my body? How does it affect my heart, my body? I want to keep my body. This body that will perish. This body that will return to soil. This body that will return to ashes. This body that we know that has no value. The body will remain on earth. But at the time of the rapture, for the believer, that body, either the body is in the deepest part of the sea, eh? that body will be resurrected. Either the body is in the wherever grave, or you say, oh, Pastor, how about those that, uh, that were born by a Christ? Is the power of God. That body, that burnt body, will be resurrected to meet the soul and the spirit of that believer. Do you understand? And then for the sinners, their own resurrection is the final resurrection. The soul and the body and their body will be, res- will be united to join and face the punishment and the torment of eternity in the lake of fire. That's why you want to examine yourself today. 
where will you spend your eternity? This is our glorious translation. We have the example of Enoch in the Bible. In Genesis chapter 5, verse 22. Look at the translation of Enoch. Genesis chapter 5. What happened to Enoch? Look at what happened to him. Genesis chapter 5, verse 24. And Enoch walked with God. And he was not. For what happened to Enoch? For what happened to Enoch? If you must partake in the rapture of the church, you must walk with God. If you must partake in this glorious resurrection we are talking about today, you must walk with God. You must not walk half-heartedly with God. You must walk fully like Enoch. He was told that Enoch walked with God and it was not. It happens to Elijah also in 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 2. Elijah, they look at the translation. Elijah was talking, to, he was talking with Elisha. And as he was talking, and he was talking, the chariot came from heaven and took him. Remember I told you at the beginning that the, new, the Old Testament prophets were ignorant of this rapture. But two of them have a counter, have experience of this glorious translation we are talking about today. So that in the mouth of two or three weaknesses every fruit shall be established. Enoch experienced it. Elijah experienced it. That is, and Jesus our Lord and Savior. He himself he experienced it. As he was talking with the disciples in Acts chapter 1 and the disciples they just saw him. immediately he was just ascending up into heaven. That's the rapture we are talking about there. This rapture of the church, the uh, glorious translation, it will happen in a moment. The rapture is the translation of God's people. Like I told you, Bible characters like Enoch, Elijah, and our Lord, Savior, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they were translated literally into heaven. Literally. They, they were translated literally. Everything. They they were not, they, it's not that they just woke up like this and they saw themselves in heaven. No. The same thing our glorious translation is something you, we, we know. We will know. We will know. Even the world will know about it. They will just know, ah, my husband is missing. My wife is missing. My children are missing. The pastor is missing. And I'm the only one left behind. You will not be a left behind believer in Jesus' name. We all go with the Lord in Jesus' name. That's why if you desire to go with the Lord at this rapture, you must be genuinely saved and be cleansed from every inward depravity. There must be holiness and righteousness of life and heart if you must go with the Lord. The rapture, like I say, will be unexpected, will be unannounced, will be sudden, will be sudden. Seven things quickly we know about this rapture. The seven things about this rapture. Number one, it has God. God as the only umpire. God is the only umpire. In fact, Jesus himself told us, he says, nobody, my father only. He says in Matthew chapter 24. If you look at this Matthew chapter 17, quickly I will show you from this Matthew chapter 24. God is the only umpire. Verse 36, Matthew 24, verily I say unto you. Matthew 24, verse 36. But of the day and the hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels of heaven. But who? But who? My Father only. When Jesus says only, he means only. Do you understand? God the Father is the umpire, the only umpire that will determine when this rapture will take place. And brethren, every sign concerning the second coming of Christ has been fulfilled already. All the signs, they have been fulfilled. There's none that have not been fulfilled. The only thing the church is waiting for now is the rapture. The only thing that, is, you know, that we are all waiting for now is the rapture of the church. And the Lord is the one, the God the Father is the one that will determine it. Number two, it will happen unannounced. It will happen unannounced. Unannounced. 
It will be sudden. In verse 50, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he look not for him. When he look not, there is no announcement. It's not going to be announced and say, oh, on the, on, the, uh, on, the, on the 3rd of October, the rapture will take place. There's nothing like that in God's calendar. It will happen unannounced. Number three, it will happen unexpectedly. Unexpectedly. In that same verse 50, when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, he is not aware of, he is not aware of, unexpectedly, unexpectedly. Number four, it will, it will be undeniable. This glorious translation, it will be undeniable. We will know it. In fact, if it so happens that the plane is flying and the two pilots happen to be the new Christian, I pity those people, the passengers in that plane, if there is nobody that knows how to fly an aeroplane, because that plane will crash. Undeniable. You will know. Two shall be walking, one shall be taken, and the other left behind. You will know, undeniable. Number five, number, number five, it will be for the unspotted, 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 the righteous one. Those who didn't give in to persecution, those who didn't give in to the iniquity, because it says in verse, three, in, verse, in verse 12, in verse 12 of Matthew, Matthew 24, verse 12, he says the that, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall was go. Iniquity shall abound. But the rapture is for those who remain unspotted. It's for those who remain clean. It's for those who remain righteous. That's why it says in verse 13, But he that shall endure unto the end, the world, the same shall be saved. The rapture, this glorious translation, number six, it is not for the unclean. It is not for the unclean. Because Jesus himself said the day. He says it's going to be like in the days of Noah. In verse 38 and verses, uh, verse, verses 38 and 39, that women are given to uncleanness, drinking, given in marriage, in all kinds of sexuality. It is at that time the trumpet will sound and the end will be inevitable. And lastly, it is, it is unique. It is unique. This glorious translation is unique. It's unique. Enoch added, Elijah added, our Lord Jesus Christ added, and Enoch did not, was not translated with his family. He did not say, my family come with me as I'm going to heaven. Elijah that was so close to Eli Elisha that was so close to Elijah did not get translated along with Elijah. No, Elijah was left behind. Now, our Lord Jesus Christ, when he was going, he went all the way literally to heaven. I'm telling you, brethren, your own righteousness will not save your children. Your own righteous, the righteousness of your husband will not save you. You need to have it. You need to have your own righteousness. You need to have your own experience. You need to have your own encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. Point through quickly the suffering during the great tribulation. The suffering. The second event that we have, we've talked about the rapture now. The first phase of his second coming. Then there's what we call the second phase of his second coming. Do you understand? The second phase. What is that second phase? It's what we call when Christ will appear in Jerusalem. And at this time, every eyes shall see him. Every eyes. Every eyes. Especially those who are the Jews that have, you know, that have um, 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 crucified him and nailed him to the cross. They will see him. They will see Christ when he will appear the second time. Because at that time, Jesus is coming to reign. And I'm coming with him. I say, I'm coming with him. And we all come with him to reign in Jesus' name. That's what Isaiah saw. And when he says, the government shall be upon his shoulder. But then, before the second phase of his coming, there is an event that will happen. This is what we call the great tribulation. The great tribulation. Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. 
Verse 21. For they shall be the what? What? But when there is a difference between tribulation and the great tribulation. Do you understand? What do I mean? Now, tribulations for us today means trials, troubles, oppositions, persecution, tribulations. For man, for Christians today, it's not the great tribulation. That's where most Christians get confused. Between the great tribulations and tribulation. Many believers, you know, some people are teaching that already we are in the great tribulation. There is nothing like that. I am not in the great tribulation. I say I am not in the great tribulation. Because the great tribulation is not for me. Before that time, I will be taken up and I will go with my Lord. But Jesus talked about the great tribulation. And he talks about the suffering. In the great tribulation, it's not a time of joy. It's not a time of pleasure. It's a time of pain. It's a time of trouble. It's a time of suffering. And the suffering of the great tribulation, we are talking about the suffering that is intense. Intense suffering. We are talking about the suffering that is extensive. Extensive suffering. We are talking about the suffering. The suffering that is severe. It's not just ordinary suffering. We are talking about a severe suffering. That's what Jesus himself said here. He says in that verse 21, for then shall be the great tribulation, such as it as not such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, not ever shall be. No, not ever shall be. Lord, what kind of suffering? What kind of thing we happen during the great tribulation? What we happen? He says in verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of these of those days, shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give a light. And the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of in the clouds of heaven with power and with what? And with what? And with great glory. That's the meaning of reign of Christ. Every eye shall see him on that day. They will see him. Do you know this great tribulation? Moses even saw it in the Old Testament. In Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4, I'll read verse 30. Look at what Moses said. He says there, When thou art in tribulation, he was writing to the children of Israel. He says, When thou art in tribulation, the great tribulation, and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days. Do you see that in your, do you see that in your Bible? In the latter days, if thou shalt turn to the Lord thy God, and shall be obedient unto his voice. Now, the great tribulation actually is God's program for the children of Israel. The great tribulation is the program that God designed so that he can use that to prepare the children of Israel for the second phase of the second coming of Christ. Of the second phase of the second coming of Christ. In fact, we are told in uh, Jeremiah himself, looked at it in Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 6 and 7, he calls it the times of Jacob's trouble. The times of Jacob's trouble, the great tribulation, is the time of, great, of Jacob's trouble. It will be a time of unprecedented suffering, devastation, damnation, and doom. Sinners and believers whose love for the Lord as was well called will go through this period of intense suffering, of severe suffering, of extensive suffering, and this suffering will last for seven o years. Seven o years. That's the time of the great tribulation. It will last. It will be a time for the first half of that seven years. The Antichrist will appear 
and we appear as a peace lover. We appear as a peace as a peacemaker, and we make peace with the children of Israel. And the peace Jerusalem has been looking for all these years. They say, "Oh, this peace has not come to us. This Antichrist, the window is an Antichrist." The one who is an antigo, the one who is a false prophet, the one who is somebody that is anti Christ because of the peace treaty he will make with them. And when he make that peace with them, for seven for the first half of the seven years, they'll be calm, they'll be like a you know false deceptive peace in Jerusalem. And the Jews will be happy. Now so our Savior has come, our Messiah has come. Our deliverer has come. But at the end of that first hour, that Antichrist will enter into the temple and he will bring abominations into that temple. He will bring, you know, he will bring defilement into the temple. And the Jews at that time, they will begin to realize, no, we don't worship God this way. No, we don't serve God this way. It is then he will not show his face. As an antichrist, and then the second, the suffering, the intense suffering, the Jews will be persecuted. And I pray for you, you will not be here. Because at the time of the great tribulation, think about this at that time, God will unleash his punishment upon the war. At the time of the great tribulation, the devil will unleash his suffering upon man. At the time of the great tribulation, demons and principalities that will unleash their terrors and their afflictions upon man. I pray you will not be here. And when you say, oh, well, pastor, where you say it's for, the, it's for the Jews, it will not happen to me. No, it will happen to you. Because all those that refuse to receive the mark of the antichrist, there will be a mark. The Bible tells us in Revelation of that mark is the mark of a man. We have a number. The number of a man. The mark is 666. All those that refuse that number, they will be tormented. They will suffer. I mean suffering. Because Jesus himself said it. So suffering has never been. You read about the First World War. Many of us were not born when the First World War took place here. Many of us were not born when the Second World War took place. But if you know, if you know what took place during the Civil War in Nigeria, those of, those of us who are of age, the suffering, the torment, the, you know, the affliction that took place. And Jesus said, the suffering of the Great Tribulation will be more than that. If you read about the Second World War, the First World War, the suffering that took place even in London, there was no food, and it got to a time, even in other places, people were eating woman flesh. And Jesus said, the suffering of the Great Tribulation will be more than that. I pray you will not be here. Amen. The suffering during the Great Tribulation, brethren, think about it. It will be a time of great suffering. It will be a time where the Antichrist will unleash his terror on the world. But before that time, I will be taken away. I will be taken away. I will not see the great tribulation. I've made up my mind. Come what may, I will not go through the great tribulation. I don't know about you. I say I will not go through the great tribulation. You know, at the time of the great tribulation, when the war and those careless believers, those careless Christians, like we learned in our study scripture, the carnal Christian that miss the rapture, when they are suffering year or not, during the great tribulation, I will be at the marriage supper of the land. There I will be in Jesus' name. You know, at that time, the Lord will not leave us alone. He will take us before the great tribulation. I said the Lord will take us before the great tribulation. Consider it. The great tribulation, number one, it will be a time of devastation. It will be a time of domination. It will be a time of doom. 
It will be a time of darkness. Think about this. The great tribulation. It will be a time of destructions. Destruction. You add of earthquakes. You add of, you know, volcanoes. You add, you add of hurricane like presently now. There is the hurricane William that is, you know, you know, afflicting some cities in the Caribbean. But the time of the great tribulation will be more than that. There will be destructions. There will be desolation and death. Those that refuse the mark of the Antichrist. It will be easy for the Antichrist soldiers to kill them immediately. Immediately. People are talking of right to life. The Antichrist and the soldiers, they, have nothing, they, have, they don't have that in their dictionary. They have nothing like right to life. When you say, oh, I will not receive the mark of the Antichrist, immediately they will kill you. You think you can hide? You think, oh, well, I, I, I will be a careless Christian. I know that uh, some Christians will still be saved, you know, after the rapture. Yes, some Christians will be saved, but they will pay with their life. It is not salvation by grace. It is salvation by your life. It is the Jews, you know, like I told you, brethren, the great revelation is the, you know, is the program God designed for the Jews. And the Jews, they are the resolute. The Jews, they are that, you know, they are that, because God will give it to them. They will have that. And then they will look up to Jesus as their Messiah. And they will have that grace at that time. But you, you, you Gentile, you that don't have, you have the privilege now. You have the door of mercy open unto you now. You have the door of grace open unto you now. You despise it. You say, well, for me, I will get saved during the great tribulation. You will pay with your life. You will die. They will kill you. I pray you will not be here in Jesus' name. Yeah. Lastly, at the time of the great tribulation, there will be a declaration of the everlasting gospel. The angels, they will declare. They will tell that nobody on earth will say he has never heard of the gospel. And then the last event the Lord told us is the one we consider lastly before we pray, the great white throne judgment. Sentence at the great white throne judgment. There is a great white throne judgment. There is judgment that is coming at the end of all things. People thought, well, Pastor, you say the end will come. Yes, the end will come. The world will be destroyed. But then you will be judged. It's not just the destruction of the earth. It's the judgment that will take place after the end of the world. This is what we call the great white throne judgment. Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. And I saw, John saw it, we are seeing it today. Don't say you've not heard about it. You are hearing it today. And I saw a great white throne, a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. At the time of the great white throne judgment, earth and heaven will flee away. There will be no place of hiding. That's what the Bible is telling us here. At the time of the great white throne, you that are committing secret sin, you say nobody sees me. The pastor doesn't see me. That brother doesn't see me. At the time of the great white throne judgment, all those secret sins you have committed in the past will be unveiled before you. Earth and heaven will fly away. No place of darkness. No place of hiding again. And I saw the day, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open. I pray your name will not be in those books. I say, I pray your name will not be in those books. And another book was opened. That's where my name will be. I said, that's where my name will be. Which is the book of life. That's the book of life. And the only way you can have your name written in that book of life is not by coming to church. It's not by, oh, I'm a member of the palace. It's not by, by dressing like a deeper life. The only way you can have your name written in the book of life is when you open your heart and you allow Jesus to come in and you accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior and you confess your sins and you turn away from those sins and you have faith in the blood of Jesus to wash away your sins. That's the only way you can have your name written in the book of life. The question comes to you today. Is your name written in that book? Are you thinking about the book of life? 
Are you thinking about that book? With, where God will write the name of the righteous there. And it says there, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books. According to what? According to what? Every action, everything you do is recorded in the, in the books, in the books, in the books of God's judgment. Everything from the day of your birth to the time of your death, everything you have ever committed, every word you have spoken, idle words, filthy words, every thought of immorality, every action of sin, of iniquity are written in that books, in those books, in those books. And the only thing that can wipe away those things from those books is the blood of Jesus Christ. Is the blood of Jesus Christ. In verse 15, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life. That's the sentence there now. That's the sentence at the great white throne judgment. It's great because you have the great God at the judgment. It's white because in him there is no darkness at all. It's a throne because he is the king of kings and the lord of lords. Jesus is the one, the judge of the whole world. There will be a great summon of all nations of the earth before God's presence for judgment. The great white throne judgment is the final judgment that will bring upon those who neglect and reject God's offer of salvation. All those nations will be judged. All those individuals will be judged. All those kings will be judged. You know, all those who reject the offer of God's salvation. All those who reject and say, well, for us, we have our own religion. We don't believe in that religion that Jesus died for is the Son of God. They will be judged. All those that say, in this country, we do not go. We know no God that will be judged. Because in Psalm 9, verse 17, Psalm 9, verse 17, the Bible says here in Psalm 9, the great white throne judgment, the sentence, the sentence at the great white throne judgment, the wicked, Psalm 9, verse 17, Psalm 9, verse 17, the wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. All the nations. It's possible for a nation to forget God. It's possible for a whole nation to forget God. It's possible for an individual to forget God. It's possible. That's why, brethren, the Lord wants us to always constantly reflect on eternity. Where will you spend eternity? We sang it today. Eternity, eternity. Where Will you spend your eternity? There's an imminent end that is coming upon the old world. Are you making preparation? We've talked about the rapture. Are you preparing yourself for the rapture of the church? We've talked about the great tribulation. Are you preparing yourself to escape the great tribulation? We've talked about the great white throne judgment. Are you preparing yourself? so that you will not be judged at that great white throne judgment. Where will you spend your eternity, my brother? Think about it. Think about it today. Where will you sing about it? Where will you spend eternity? This question comes to you and me. Tell me, what shall your answer be? Where will you spend eternity? Your eternity. Repent, brethren, if you've gone into sin. Repent before it is too late. Believe this very hour. Trust in the Savior's grace and power. Then your joyous answer will be saved through a long eternity. Consider your eternity. Will not leave you on earth forever. 
The maximum you can live is in the hundreds. That's the maximum you can live now. There's no scientific proof to tell us now that we can live 200 years old. I've never seen that now, except the one I read in the Bible. There's no scientific proof. The, more, the maximum the world can give you today is your hundred, if you get there. Are you considering your eternity? An eternity. Can I describe eternity with you? Can I describe eternity for you? Eternity. What can I use to describe eternity? Can you don't see a five years old boy, a five years old boy, that will go to Aberdeen Beach with a 50 ml cup and take that Aberdeen Beach water, take the water there, and walk all the way from Aberdeen to Glasgow and go and pour that water into that field in Glasgow. And it will come back again to Aberdeen, to that same beach. You know, you all know that Aberdeen beach. And we still take that 50 ml of water and walk all the way again to Glasgow and pour the water. By the time that five years old boy drained the whole of Aberdeen beach water, the North Sea, and transfer it into Glasgow, if it is possible, I'm telling you, that is just a fraction. It's not even up to a fraction of eternity. It's not even up to a fraction of eternity. Consider your eternity, my brother. Where will you spend your eternity? We will not live in this world forever. This world will soon end. Have you considered your life? You've considered your behavior? You've considered your attitude? You consider your life. Do you still have the grace of God in your life? Do you still have the love of God in your heart? All you are doing now is just doing religion, playing religion. It's not all about religion. It's all about where will you spend your eternity. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayers. Where will you spend your eternity? My brother, my sister, We've talked about all this. Are you getting ready for eternity? Eternity with God? Are you preparing yourself for eternity? Let's examine ourselves today. If there's backsliding in your life, repent of it. If there's sin in your life, confess it. Ask the Lord to forgive you. Ask the Lord to cleanse you. Ask the Lord to pardon you. Eternity is certain. Eternity is free. Where will you spend your eternity? You have salvation from sin. Are you separating yourself from all the sinful war and its lusts? Are you subjecting your sexual flesh to the will of God? Are you praying daily for daily sufficiency of grace? Are you submissive to the Savior and to His Lordship? Are you sanctified by the Spirit of God, the Adamic nature put it in your heart? Are you giving yourself to the service of sowing? These are the things we need to do if we must be preparing ourselves for eternity with God. Let's talk to the Lord in prayers today. Ask the Lord to prepare you Eternity, eternity, where will you spend your eternity?